Hi, everyone. Yeah, thanks for being here. Oh, uh, yeah, again, sorry for the inconvenience. So both the tutorial and the lecture will take place online today uh, in the Zoom room. Um, yeah, so let us start. You can always uh, send send your questions in the chat. There is already a question. Are these notes going to, going to be uploaded? Yes, I can upload the notes uh, if you want me to. Uh, OK. So also the topics we're going to discuss today in the tutorial, they don't, you will not need any information from the upcoming lecture or the lecture that didn't happen on Tuesday. So let me just, without further ado, start. Uh, OK, so first, uh, there are three topics we're going to discuss today. So the first is a bit lengthy. We're going to derive the time evolution of the position variance of the free particle. Uh, then we'll address the question that uh, came up in the lecture, which is why we take the basis um, and the, the take the uh, the cat bra of the basis and sum them up. We're going to get the identity, and finally we'll discuss the Gaussian wave packets. Uh, hopefully we'll have time for everything. So uh, let us start with the evolution of the position variance. So. In the lecture, we've already seen uh, the free particle. Um, and the free particle is the system which is described by a following Hamiltonian. So it's just a free Hamiltonian H, which is P squared over two mu. This is an, uh, anal anal analogous to the classical case where we, we if we just consider the a Hamiltonian of the freely moving particle without any potential. So basically, in this case, the potential V equals zero. This is free particle. And, uh, and the, uh, the variance we'll be looking at is the position variance and the position variance delta x t squared uh, which it, of course it depends on time t is the um, the average of the x squared at time t minus the average of x at time t squared. So this is just the uh, usual definition of the variance. And now we'll follow um, a bunch of steps to get to the um, yeah to get to the answer how this. How, what is the exact solution for delta x t squared for the free particle? A uh, few things before we start. So in the lecture, we've seen that due to the Ehrenfest theorem um, and Ehrenfest theorem is the theorem which allows us to, uh, to say what is the time derivative of the average uh, of a particular operator. So for the X and P operators, um, this theorem gives us that the time derivative of the X of the position is basically P, the average of P over mu. And for the, for the momentum P, it gave us that uh, D by DT of P uh, is minus average of d by dx v of x t. Uh, and in this case, um, in this case, this is zero because for the free particle, v is zero. And this is important because then uh, for the free particle, we see that its average momentum is conserved. So basically the average p at time t is equal to the average p at time zero. Uh, v here is the potential. So usually the Hamiltonian can be written as this free particle Hamiltonian plus the v of x. And v is just the potential the, the particle is in. 
So for example, as a classical um, analog, one can imagine that um, we have a particle which is not only moving, but is also in the gravitational field. Then it has an additional, a classically additional potential energy MGX, which is the, an example of such a potential V. Uh, okay, so the first step, in a first step, we're gonna use um, this equation above. So we have that d by dt of x times t uh, is average of p at time t over mu. Uh, and the average of p at time t is the same as the average of p at time zero. Because for the free particle, the average of the momentum does not change. Uh, OK, so then we have the following differential equation that d by dt of this average is equal to um, uh, average of p at time zero over mu. And the average of p at time zero is just some number. So basically, then we can solve this differential equation for the average of x and get that the average of x at time t is the average of p at time zero over mu t plus the initial condition on x. So the initial condition of x is the x, the average of x at time zero. Okay, so it seems that my iPad is disconnected. So let me try to connect it again. Yeah, okay, now it's good. So uh, average of X at time zero. Uh, okay, and Given this expression, we can now find um, in our variance the part with the expression which corresponds to the average of x at time t squared. So then the average of x at t squared would be just the square of this expression here. And we can write it as average of x at time zero squared plus average of p squared over mu squared t squared plus two average of x average of p at time zero over mu t. Okay, so this is the result we've got for average x squared. Let us just write this down, remember this, and now continue to analyze the, the another term in the expression, which is the average of x squared. Okay, so now next step of our consideration is we, we start to analyze average of x squared term t. And the first thing that we try to do is the following. So we take the time derivative of this expression. So what is the time derivative here? So one can just directly use Ehrenfest theorem or um, maybe now just to uh, also repeat how, how Ehrenfest theorem works. Let us just derive this directly. So how do we uh, derive this? So we know we have our, our Schrodinger equation, right? So in a Schrodinger equation tells us that um, 
IH D by DT of Psi equals the Hamiltonian Psi. Okay, this means that D by DT of Psi is minus um, I over H. And here what I did is just like put the I on the other side and there we get one over I and one over I is minus I. So here we have minus I over H, um, a Hamiltonian acting on Psi. And for this case, we know that Hamiltonian is P squared over two mu. So what we get here is minus I over two mu uh, H bar, uh, P squared acting on Psi. Um, and if we, if we take the conjugate of this expression, then uh, d by dt of bra psi would be just the conjugate of the expression on the right-hand side. So it's gonna be i over two mu h bar uh, psi p squared. Uh, okay, now let us Again, come back to the expression above. So what we have here is this. This is equal to d by dt psi x squared psi plus, um, so, okay, there are questions. So why is one over i equals my, uh, minus i? Because um, i squared is minus one uh, by definition. So minus i squared would be one, which means that one over i equals one equals minus i. Uh, okay, so here formally, now we would have the term which would correspond to uh, bra psi d by dt of x squared psi. But in this convention, um, which is called like Schrodinger convention, we assume that the operators themselves, they don't, uh, they don't depend on time. So, and it's only there, it's only the wave function and then the average uh, value of the operator depend on time. So basically, that's why the, uh, the, the time derivative of x squared would give us zero. Of course, there is other convention, um, which is called Heisenberg convention, in which we, on the other hand, assume that it is not the wave function, but the operators that are, are dependent on time, but we'll not talk about this here. So here, we just assume that the wave function changes in this way. Uh, so here, then the last term would be bra psi x squared d by dt psi. Okay, so the expressions for both of the derivatives, we already written them here and here. So what we get is uh, I over H to mu uh, psi P squared X squared psi minus I over two mu H psi and my iPad has disconnected again, I'm sorry. Yeah, so the first term, basically what I've written now is the, the first term corresponds to this term and then the second term um, now I'm writing it out 
So if we get this here, i over two mu h bar psi, x squared, p squared, psi. So basically what we're gonna get here is i over two mu h, and then the, um, the expression that we're taking the average of is p squared x squared minus x squared p squared, which corresponds to the average of the commutator of p squared x squared at time t. Okay, uh, now the next step would be is uh, to calculate this commutator. So now we want to calculate what is this uh, expression, p squared x squared commutator. To calculate this, we will also derive a very, a very important, a very useful uh, equation for the commutators, which is, um, so if we take the commutator of Yeah, I'm sorry again. I don't know why this always happens with this iPad. Let me stop sharing and try screen sharing again. Voya. Maybe it's a Wi-Fi issue. I'm not entirely sure. Okay, let me try to do this with cable. Okay, can you see my screen again? Okay, cool. Hopefully this will work better. I'm sorry for the disruption. So um, here we'll derive an important uh, expression for the commutators. So if we take the commutator of um, AB, of the operator AB and the operator C, then I will claim that this is equal to a commutator of BC uh, plus uh, AC commutator B. So why is this why is this correct? So let us just um, consider the right hand side of this equation. So this is equal to A, B, C minus C, B plus uh, A, C minus C, A, B. This is then equal to A, B, C minus A, C, B plus ACB minus CAB. So these two terms go away 
and we are left with ABC minus CAB. This is equal to our initial thing because this is AB by C minus C by AB. So this is just the commutator of A, B, C. Okay, and this is very um, kind of important expression to remember about our commutators because we can use it a lot. For example, here, when we will, we'll calculate the commutator of P squared and X squared. Okay, now, let us come back to our p squared and x squared. So what is p squared x squared commutator? We can write it out as p by p x squared. Um, and according to our, our previous consideration, which I will copy here because I changed the sheet so it's going to be a b and c a b c plus c sorry plus a c b uh so applying this and taking um a equal to p b equal to p and c equal to x squared um we'll obtain the following. So it's going to be P, P X squared plus P X squared P. Okay, so here I just apply the formula. Uh, okay, so now what we have to do is to apply the formula again, but now to calculate P X squared. So what is P X squared? This is minus X squared P because uh, if we take the commutator of AB, it's always minus the commutator of BA, just per definition. Uh, and here we apply the formula again because this is basically minus commutator of X X P which is, um, so in this case, we just have X A, X B, and P is a C. So then we have minus X, X B, minus X P, X. And from the lecture, we already know that the commutator of X and P is equal to IH by identity. So here we have two times this XP, and then this is equal to minus two IH X, because this is IH, this is IH by identity, and then we have X. Okay. This means that uh, our initial expression, P squared X squared commutator is equal to uh, P minus two I H X plus minus two I H X P. So here I just substitute uh, P X squared commutator by this expression. And hence what we get is minus two I H P X plus X P. Uh, this allows us to um, to rewrite what we had before. So before we were taking the time derivative of X squared and we got this expression here. So we can rewrite it as 
d by dt of x squared t equals, so we had that this is i over two mu h bar, and the average of this expression, the average of commutative p squared x squared time t. But now we know that the commutator of p squared x squared is equal to minus two i h p x plus x p. So what we get is i over two mu h minus two i h um, average of p x plus x p times t. So here we use, um, we just use that i squared equals minus one again. So then i by minus i gives us one, two goes away, h bar goes away, and we are left with one over mu px plus xp uh, at time t. Okay, yeah, this is not yet the end. The next, uh, the next step we're gonna take is, um, so let us just, again, uh, keep in mind this expression. So the expression that we got here is this one. And continue to the next step where we take the derivative of this expression. So which step is this? This is number four. So just to give you maybe um, a light in the end of the road, the idea of this analysis is to kind of get, get a differential equation for uh, the average of x squared and then, and then simply solve it. Uh, that's, that, that's why we keep, like, we keep taking various time derivatives of the expressions. Uh, so yeah, now we analyze what is the time derivative of the average of px plus xp. Uh, again, this is the instance of, uh, of Ehrenfeld's theorem. And again, let us calculate this directly. So what we get is uh, the time derivative of psi px plus xp psi. So this is equal to d by dt of bra psi. Um, then we have px plus xp psi plus psi px plus xp uh, and the time derivative of the ket. Okay, what is the time derivative of the of the bra? We already seen it from the from the Schrodinger, Schrodinger equation. So we just write that this is i over two mu h bar uh, psi. And here we have to multiply by p squared. So it's gonna be p squared px plus p squared xp psi minus i over two mu h. Now we're just write, uh, writing out the derivative of the ket. So it's i over two mu h uh, psi. Now we have to um, multiply by p squared on the, on the right. So we have px p squared plus xp p squared psi. So now let us take out i over two mu h bar. And here, we, uh, what we get, we get the following average. 
So we get P squared PX minus PX P squared. I'm just regrouping the terms. So I regroup this one with this one. And there are two left, which is P squared XP minus XP P squared. These are just these two terms. The average at time t. And here we see that we have two commutators. So the first commutator is here. This is the commutator of P squared and PX. And this is the second commutator, which is the commutator of P squared XP. So basically, we can write that this is equal to I over two mu h bar, average of, this, of the sum of two commutators, which are P squared PX plus P squared XP time t. Okay, only a few steps left. So the next step, as you might guess, is to again use that nice rule that we have for the commutators and calculate these two. So what is, for example, the commutator of p squared px? Uh, so, for example, we can do it this way. So we can write that this is p minus px p squared commutator and use our rule again. So again, to remind you, our rule was the commutator of a, b, c would be equal to a commutator of b, c plus commutator of a, c, b. So here, for example, uh, P is A, X is B, and P squared is C. Which means that we can write this as minus P, X, P squared, minus P, P squared, commutator, X. Uh, so here what we get is, so the commutator of P and P squared is equal to zero because P by P squared is P to the power of three and P squared by P is also P to the power of three. It's the same operator, they trivially commute. So what we're left with is minus P X P squared which is equal to P, P squared X. And here we apply our rule again, because this is simply P, P by P, X uh, commutator. And here we have that P is A, B is also P, and C is X. And so here we arrive to P by P, PX plus P, PX, P. And here we use the fact that PX is equal to minus xp, which is equal to minus ih identity. Um, and so here we get minus p squared ih minus p squared ih. And we get minus two ih P squared. And so the second one 
I will not do the calculation here, but it goes essentially the same way. And basically analogously, you can get that P squared XP. So this is the second commutator here will actually give you the same thing. So it's equal to minus two I H P squared. But the process there goes uh, absolutely similar as here. I'll just leave it for you as homework since you still have to do something in your exercise sheet. Uh, okay, so now let us substitute our findings. So this uh, and this into our expression for the time derivative here. So what we get is from four, we get d by dt px plus xp uh, average at time t equals to i over two mu h bar average of minus four i h p squared at time t. Why four? Because we sum up here two times this. Uh, this means that this is equal to, so I by minus I again gives us um, one, then four by two gives it, four over two gives us two, H bar goes away. So here we get two over mu P squared at time T average. Okay. Uh, then remember what we got here. So we uh, we got here that the time derivative of x squared time t would be equal to one over mu uh, px plus xp average. Uh, now let us take the second derivative of this expression. So if we take the second derivative of this expression, we will get that d by dt squared of x squared at time t equals d by dt um, uh, one over mu, yes, one over mu d by dt of this expression. And the time derivative of this expression we know. So it is one over mu, two over mu, p squared time t, which is two over mu squared, p squared at time t. Um, and again, by the same um, argument as before. So one can show that uh, the average of p squared, um, so the, 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 time, the time derivative of the average of p squared is equal to zero. This, is, uh, this follows from Ehrenfeld's theorem. Um, and basically, physically, this can be explained as that uh, because we have a free particle, its momentum is conserved. So by momentum here, of course, we mean, we mean the observable momentum, which is the average of the momentum. And from this, it follows that the, uh, the average of p squared at time t actually equals the average, its average at time zero, which is one of the initial conditions, which means that we have the following easily solvable differential equation, which is that the second derivative of x squared uh, average would be two over mu squared, p squared at time zero. And of course we need uh, 
initial conditions uh, to solve this. And the initial conditions would be that uh, the x squared at time equals zero uh, would be just x squared zero. And then the second initial condition is actually given to us uh, by the just uh, the differential equation for the x squared for the first derivative of x squared. So what we have here is d by dt of x squared at time t would be equal to one over mu xp plus px um, at time t, which means that um, the derivative of x squared at time zero should be equal to one over mu xp plus px at time zero. That gives us the second initial condition. So just this follows from this. So we have a second order differential equation for x squared, and we have two initial conditions, which means that we can solve this equation exactly. And if we solve this equation exactly, what we get is x squared at time t would be x squared at time zero plus um, one over mu px plus xp at time zero t uh, plus, so this constant here comes from the, from this initial condition. And this constant here comes from this initial condition. And finally, the last term is proportional to t squared, which is p squared at time zero over mu squared t squared. So this is just simply solving this uh, differential equation. Uh, and then, so let me let me quickly finish with this and then we can go for a break. Uh, then finally, what we get is, so we have this expression here. Let me copy it to the other page. And also before, just when we started, we got our expression for just x squared, um, x average of x squared, which is here. So we have these two expressions. And now we can calculate the uh, delta x squared, which is the difference in these two. And we see, for example, that uh, uh, x squared uh, average at time zero goes away. And what we're left with is um, the following. And we also, let us also note that the uh, average of p squared at time zero minus the average of p um, at time zero squared would be the variance of p at time zero. So we get this term here. And then we get the remaining term, which is not that nice. Ah, sorry, yes, I made a mistake by saying that x squared goes to zero because, um, yeah, the, the square there is in different places. So actually what we get is the difference between this term and this term, which is the variance, because here we have the average of x squared and here we have the average of x squared, which gives us the variance of x at time zero. Okay, and by this, we got the, uh, the expression for the evolution of the 
uh, variants of the free particle. And we see that uh, actually this, um, actually it, uh, it, it uh, so this, this variance, it increases uh, with time because here we have the term which is proportional to, um, so this is T here, I forgot. Uh, so here we have the, um, the term which is proportional to T squared, which in, in a limit of large times, of course, will overpower this term. And so we see that um, in a limit of large T, this will be the prevailing term and the variance will increase. So it's like, you can see that, okay, if we start with the free particle, which is kind of this very, uh, very sharply located packet, then with time it will, it will um, evolve into the packet, which is more um, widely distributed over the uh, x-axis. Okay, I think now we can, uh, we can take a break. Uh, yeah, please ask any questions if you have to. Uh, and also you can send me the questions in the chat. After the break, uh, so after 15 minutes, we'll, we'll continue with the uh, Gaussian wave packets and how the basis sums up to identity.
Okay, I got a question um, about the point four. Okay, the point four before this. Ah, yes, here. Uh, so what we get, what we get, so where, where the psi went, um, I mean, psi didn't go anywhere. So whenever we say we take an average, uh, what we mean is, like, for example, if we have the uh, some operator A and we say we, this is the average at time T, what we mean is psi A psi. And so here I just write the psi explicitly because uh, because I, I want to I want to see what I need to take time derivatives of. And but otherwise, yeah, it's it's still hidden in here on both sides.
Okay, let's continue. Um, so first, we're going to tackle a relatively simple thing, which is why basis sums up to identity. And by this, I mean that, so if you have a basis, also in the continuous cases, and we're gonna show this in the continuous case and in the finite case, um, this will immediately follow, or you could you could just show, show it in a similar way. Uh, so we have this basis, which is orthonormal, which means that x, x prime is the delta function. And then there is one thing uh, we can immediately do is we can just always write out the identity as the following integral from minus infinity to plus infinity dx x x. Uh, so why does this hold? So let us take the uh, the expression on the right hand side and. Now let us, for example, in the X basis, let us analyze which kind of um, components it has. So to do so, we just you know, let us just see how it acts on, on the case when we have, here we have X prime and here we have X double prime. So this is the same as thinking, like also taking an analogy to uh, to a finite dimensional case. And in finite dimensional case, what we have is like this is uh, this is not an integral. This is a sum, and we're basically summing over um, these elements of the matrix. So this is well, what we get out is is a particular matrix. And then to see what the elements of the matrix are, we just look at the corresponding element uh, matrix elements and the particular row and column, and then see, and then analyze what they are. Uh, so what we see here is if we do the same analogy in the uh, in a in a continuous dimension case, what we get is the following, and here we can put them inside the integral. So what we get is the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, uh, x prime x, x, x double prime. And what we get is dx, a delta, x prime minus x, delta x minus uh, x double prime, which means that, let us say that we take this delta function, which means that the function has to be evaluated at x equals x prime. So what we get out is delta of x prime minus x double prime, because in this expression, we just substitute um, x x by x prime, and this is equal to x prime identity x double prime uh, for all x x double prime in R, which means that since this holds for all x prime and x double prime, uh, which form a basis. So from this, we can conclude that our initial expression is indeed equal to the identity. So this is also true, for example, um, for, uh, for finite dimensions. So for the finite dimension, for example, for the qubits, if, we, if you have a basis which is 0, 1, which a label is 0, 1, then the identity can always be written as just 0, 0, plus 1, 1. 
uh, and whenever you change the basis, um, the identity is not uh, is not affected by this. And one way to see this is because when, whenever we change the basis, the change of basis can be seen as some unitary transformation. Um, but then if you apply unitary transformation to transform this matrix identity, what you get is U identity, U dagger. It's just the usual change of basis. Um, when we change from one ortho orthogonal basis to, to the other, but this is equal to U, U dagger, which gives us the identity again. So basically, uh, the way to write an identity when you have an orthonormal basis is to just sum up um, this cat bros over the whole basis. Okay. Uh, so again, please always let me know if I'm still talking like I'm writing something, but nothing appears, which means that again, my connection has screwed up. Yeah, I basically wrote the thing here because we have the identity, then we transform it according to the basis transformation. And then we get the identity again, because the basis transformation corresponds to unitary in the cases we consider. Okay, so this was a small detour. And now let us go to a final uh, topic for today, which are Gaussian wave packets. So in a last exercise class, we already discussed the Gaussians and we already noted that um, the Gaussians are, have this very nice property that uh, the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is also a Gaussian. Uh, and now we also, now let us use, uh, let us use this very nice um, property to, to, uh, to take a Gaussian and describe um, a wave function with this Gaussian. So when we describe wave functions, uh, there, is, there, there is this uh, notion of wave packets, which are basically um, these wave functions, which um, of course it's hard for me to draw, to draw the, um, the wave function itself, because it's uh, yeah, because because it's um, complex. But the way I can do it is to say that okay. Uh, so first I draw the psi squared. Or yeah, actually, let me just draw kind of the modulus of psi. So this is without the phase, and then. You can see, you, you can imagine that uh, the wave function itself also has some phase, so it also oscillates, but within this shape. And this shape is called the envelope of the wave function. And then generally, the wave function in this case can be written as psi of x equals phi of x e to the power ikx. So, and the phi of x is exactly this envelope. So basically you can see that, so phi of x is always some function which is, which is real. Uh, and it, in this case, for example, it can be this shape. And then we also add some phase, uh, phase on it. So for example, um, then if we take the, I don't know, real part of, of this psi of x, then what we, what we get out of here is the cosine, for example. And then you can see that, you can imagine that kind of the, the wave function oscillates within this envelope. And one example of the, of, 
the envelope function, and, and which is also a very common choice due to its nice properties, is exactly the Gaussian. So the envelope is one over uh, two pi sigma squared uh, root four uh, exponential of minus x minus x zero squared over four sigma squared and then the psi of x, the total wave function, is this envelope function, 2 pi sigma squared, exponential of minus x minus x zero squared over four sigma squared, e to the power i k x. Uh, so how does the Gaussian look like? So, it, so in this case, this function y of x, it is centered around x equals x zero. Uh, so it has its maximal value uh, at x equals x zero. This can be easily seen from this exponential. And uh, it has like width uh, two sigma. So like it's characteristic with this two sigma. Uh, this function is used in many applications. Um, so for example, in, in probability theory, um, it's a very uh, common distribution to use. And again, its main, um, its main property that, its, ma its main property wise it's very useful is that uh, it's easily integratable, um, and all the moments of this function can be uh, can be analytically found and so on. So it's kind of a very uh, comfortable function to work with, which is also smooth and kind of exists from minus infinity to plus infinity. Uh, okay, but now. Let us, add, let us just take this uh, example, the wave function, and analyze it. And the first thing that we would like to do is to calculate the momentum wave function. Uh, so there are a few important integrals uh, to know when you work with the Gaussian. So one that we will need here is the following. So the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, e to the power minus x squared dx equals square root of pi. Uh, so I will not uh, derive this here. I think one of the ways to derive it is in Wikipedia. Also, there is a very interesting way how to derive it with like using the Fourier transform, but uh, you don't need to know that. Basically, you just need to know that uh, the value of this integral, and then you, you'll be able to calculate any Gaussian integral. Uh, okay. So, momentum wave function, psi, uh, say tilde uh, of p is equal to we just take the Fourier transform. So it's one over square root of two pi h bar, integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, psi of x e to the power minus i x p over h bar dx. Okay, now let us just input the psi of x in there. So what we get is one over square root of two pi h bar integral over dx one over um, power four root two pi sigma squared exponential of minus x squared over four sigma squared. Is a question? Oh yes, thank you for letting me know. Um, so the problem is that 
I'm sharing via AirPlay. And when I share via AirPlay, it suddenly it has a habit of suddenly stopping sharing. Uh, and when and, and last time I shared, I in the end I shared with a cable, but that means I have to un uh, unplug the cable from my computer. Uh, which means that my computer was dying by the end of the session. So um, thanks for letting me know. I'll just try to keep an eye on this and um, see when it stops sharing so I can reshare. Uh, anyway, so here, nothing special happening. I'm just writing out Psi of X as a Gaussian we have, uh, which made a mistake and so here we have exponential of x minus x zero squared over four sigma squared e to the power uh, minus i x p over h bar and we also have plus i k x uh, okay now what I will do is I will change the variable. So I will take x minus x0 and relabel it by x, which means I'm just um, I'm just shifting everything by x0. Uh, this does not affect the, the limits of the integration. Uh, so it's still from minus infinity to plus infinity because x0 is just some constant or Gaussian is centered around, uh, but it will affect the term in the complex exponential here. So here, instead of X, I'll just have X plus X zero. Okay, so I will also take out this two pi sigma squared uh, with a root of fourth power and here, I will be left with integral over x uh, exponential of minus x squared over four r uh, sigma squared. And here I'll be left with, let me regroup this in the following way, minus i p minus h bar k x plus x zero. So here I, what I did, I just took out in this expression, uh, i x here and here, then I'm left with p minus h bar k, everything over h bar. Uh, so, and then I substitute x by x plus x zero, because this is my change of variable. And uh, why I'm doing this change of variable is because I want to, um, I want to be able to converge to this type of integral with some coefficient. So I would just be able to take it uh, with pi and then some scaling on x. Okay, so then something, there is a part in this complex exponential which does not depend on x, which is with this x zero. So this I can also take out. So, I'll get one minus, so e to the power uh, minus i p minus h bar k x zero over h bar. Uh, then here I will still have my not so pretty uh, roots. And now I have the integral of the following. We're still not done. Uh, we have exponential of minus x squared over four sigma squared uh, minus i p minus h bar k x over h bar dx. And here again, I use a very uh, common technique while calculating the Gaussian integrals. I need to um, I need to extract a square out of this. So in the end, I want an expression of the form of minus x minus something squared over the sigma something. So 
this is what I'm trying to do. So I'm just uh, extracting the full square. And how do I do this? Well, this is in this case pretty simple. So here what we get is this is exponential of minus x plus 2i sigma p minus hk over h bar squared minus sigma squared p minus hk squared over h bar squared. So I will not do this in detail here, but the idea here is just uh, yeah, take out this full square so we can just integrate it. And then we're also left with this um, remainder term here, uh, which would just go out, out of the uh, integration. Okay, so now let me sum up what we got. And we got the following. So we have the exponential that we've taken out before. We also have the term here, which does not depend on x. So we also take it out. So this is sigma squared p minus hk squared over h bar squared. Uh, then we have our very ugly root. So it's root of two pi sigma and root of two pi sigma squared. And then we are left with the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity over x exponential of minus x plus two i sigma p minus hk over h bar squared over um, four sigma squared. And here again, the idea is the same. So we first shift. And in this case, we're allowed to shift because even though this is complex, like in the limit of uh, big X, this um, this complex part doesn't really play any role. So it's so in the limit of big X, this um, this is um, this still converges to infinity, and uh, hence and then we also need to scale uh, with with what we have in the denominator. So it's four sigma squared. So and then we also use that the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity dx e to the minus x squared equals square root of pi. But now we just need to uh, to also uh, scale it with this four sigma squared. So basically, what we get is uh, for this integral. Let me just write it out. Here. Yeah. Then for this integral, what we get is square root of pi, four sigma squared, also squared root, because um, when we're scaling the x squared with four sigma squared, we're scaling the x with square root of four sigma squared. Okay, so then um, what we get is the following. So if we take um, or our roots, then we arrive to root of the power four, p squared 16 sigma to the power four over four pi squared sigma squared, two pi sigma squared. Um, and then we are left with first the exponential, like the real exponential over p, and then also the a complex exponential, which depends on p and x zero. So I write them separately because 
uh, we, when we analyze the wave function. So this is just the momentum wave function, right? And here we get that this is again just the um, the envelope function, and this is the phase. And indeed, here we see that. Um, yeah, let me maybe first massage this equation for the uh, for the root. So here we get two uh, sigma squared. Right, or is there a sigma squared? Ah, oh, sorry. Yes, I made a mistake here. Here it's not two pi sigma, this is two pi h bar. So here we have h bar squared, yes. Then we are left indeed with two sigma squared over pi h squared. Uh, exponential of minus sigma squared p minus uh, hk squared over h squared. And then we have the phase minus i p minus hk x zero over h. And this is our momentum wave function. And indeed we see that it is, uh, it is also Gaussian with respect to p because we see that our envelope function is a Gaussian. But in this case, it's just a Gaussian. So if we take the modulus of psi tilde of B, so this is a Gaussian which is centered around HK and has a characteristic width of h bar over sigma. Okay, uh, so here we indeed have confirmed that Gaussian um, transforms into a Gaussian. Now, uh, the next question we can ask is what are the average um, position and momentum for this wave packet? And this is fairly easy to, um, to calculate. And one can even calculate this by just looking at the uh, envelope function uh, of this of this packet. So for example, for the um, for the average position of the packet, we see that the envelope fun function of the packet um, is is distributed around x equals x zero. Um, and it's symmetric with respect to um, to x equals x zero which means that um, in principle, when we, when we take the average, we should, we should, get, uh, we should get x zero because this is where, where the packet is centered around. So this is just the intuition of why we get that. So we would get that um, x equals x zero. And the same for, for the momentum. So for the momentum, we would get that um, the average momentum would be HK because, um, because the wave packet is um, the momentum or, or the momentum wave function is kind of concentrated around this value and also symmetric around it. So this is something, the value that we would expect to get This is similar as the same as in probability theory when you take a Gaussian probability distribution, uh, if you worked with it, and then cal calculate its um, uh, the the average of the x, then you would get the uh, the x zero, so the the value around which the Gaussian is uh, concentrated. 
Uh, of course, one can also um, prove this uh, mathematically. Uh, so basically, one can just directly calculate the average of the position. So what is the average of position? It's psi x psi. And psi is mm, so we would get the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity. Yes, thank you. I think I disconnected again. Okay, now should be connected again. Thank you. Uh, yes, now, now we, sh we should see this. So the average of x is the, just the psi x psi, which, which is equal to the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity. Uh, psi star of x, x psi of x dx. And here we can just write x as a variable instead of the operator because we know that um, the operator still not working. Okay. Check. Yeah. Okay. Now it should be working. So we can write this as an integral. Um, just of this psi star of x x psi of x are uh, taken over dx and we can here we can substitute the operator x by just x because we know that in the position basis the x operator simply acts as um, as a function x uh, okay so then what we get is integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, uh, one over squared, sorry, or root of the fourth, fourth power, two pi sigma squared, exponential of minus x minus x zero squared over four sigma squared, e to the power i k x. Then we have x. Um, Oh, sorry, e to the power minus i k x because here we ha we have to take the complex conjugate, and then we just write the original wave function, which is again this ugly coefficient, um, exponential of minus x minus x zero squared, where four sigma squared. Uh, e to the power i k x, and we integrate this over dx. And here we see that the phase uh, goes away because e to the power minus i k x by e to the power i k x would just be the, Okay, sorry. So here we would see that e to the power i k x by e to the power minus i k x would just give us the identity. Uh, so one, so the phase goes away. And what we are left with is basically the, um, the Gaussian integral again. So let me continue this on the next page. And let me reshare again. So now I'm just rewriting what I had on a previous page. So what I had is integral from minus infinity to plus infinity. Um, I integrate over dx. Then I also combine these two roots and get just the usual square root. So get one over square root of two pi sigma squared, um, exponential uh, of x minus x 
minus x zero squared over two sigma squared. And here I get the two because I need to um, sum up these two um, terms in the exponential. And I still have the x. Yeah, and I integrate over x. Okay, so now what we do, we substitute, we again do the change of variable. So what we get is exponential of minus x squared over two sigma squared, uh, x plus x zero. And now we have two integrals. So now I just write this as sum of the two integrals. So the first integral is integral from minus infinity to plus infinity dx, this coefficient, x exponential of minus x squared over two sigma squared plus x zero, which I can take out, um, integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, uh, one over square root of two pi sigma squared exponential of minus x squared over two sigma squared. So the first thing to note here is that actually this integral is zero. Why is it zero? Because we have an um, even function, which is this exponential. So even function is the function which is which um, which satisfies that f of x equals f of minus x. So it's symmetric around the, um, the zero. Uh, and we're integrating an odd function uh, with the even function, which means that the part uh, from minus infinity to zero will compensate the part from zero to plus infinity. So these two integrals will be equal. So basically then the whole, um, so they will be equal, but with different with different signs, and then the whole integral will just uh, collapse zero, because these two parts would compensate each other. So, uh, and this is generally true when you're integrating an odd function with respect to even function. Uh, and then the second integral, which we also integrate over x, will just give us. Um, one over square root of two pi sigma squared. And here what we get will be pi, and then we again scale the x and use the Gaussian integral. So he would have square root of pi by two sigma squared. And this will give us one. So then this means that what we get here is just x zero, this. Uh, similarly, one can also analyze the average momentum. And this is easier to do uh, when you just consider the, um, the momentum wave function because there P is just the corresponds to the function P and not, and not like in a position momentum when it corresponds to the function minus IH, derivative of X, you need to take the derivative. This is a bit more cumbersome. So it's easier here to work in the um, momentum representation to calculate this integral. And here you will see the same thing. Namely, um, you have this uh, calculated representation in a, in a momentum uh, basis. And basically then this phase will go away because you're multiplying conjugate uh, momentum wave function, which is the wave function. And here we will again need to calculate P uh, with, this, um, with this Gaussian. And by the same logic that we used before, we would get out just this H bar K. But as I said already, uh, this can already be seen by from the fact that we are taking the Gaussian as the envelope of the function, then the Gaussian is um, the expected value of the Gaussian is always the um, 
is x this x zero it is um it is shifted for it is shifted from the um from the zero basically okay and also in this exercise i will not do this now but you also need to calculate the variance of x which is x squared minus x squared uh and variance of p so these averages you already know we've calculated them with average x squared and average p squared it's going to be a bit uh, a bit more cumbersome you will need to calculate it directly as in so the average of the x squared would be integral from minus infinity to plus infinity psi um conjugate of x x squared psi of x dx um and for p you can do the same in the momentum representation Uh, so one integral to uh, generally look up and which is also very useful when doing this quotient integrals is the following, which is the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, x to the power n minus x squared dx. So yeah, I didn't look it up. I can look it up now, but generally, uh, for calculating the, for example, the variance. Uh, you will need the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, uh, x squared e to I'm not sure what happened here. Let me just one last comment. Um, suddenly I was thrown out of the room. It's fine. Um, so basically what I was saying is that in general, it's good to know the, the value of this integral. So let me see. So one thing you can already um, kind of see about this integral is that, for example, when n is odd, we're integrating an odd function together with the even function, and that will give us zero. So basically, this will be zero for odd n. And then for even n, uh, look up in Wikipedia. So for Wikipedia has this moment of the uh, normal distribution or moments of this Gaussian distribution listed. So the one you would need, for example, is this x squared e to the power minus x squared dx to calculate these two integrals. Okay, uh, I think this is all for today. I'm also out of time. So thank you for staying with me here, especially with all the technical difficulties and the screen uh, start, which stops sharing from time to time due to unknown reason. Uh, yeah, hope you enjoyed this, thanks. Yeah, the lecture will be here in 15 minutes, I think. So you can come back here. <laughs>